Welcome to Africa Tea. I'm Vivian Birchall, your host. Historically, people have studied space using cycles of the moon for religious and agricultural purposes and the positions of the stars and constellations for navigation. In the last century, this interest led to space exploration. The Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite into orbit on October 4, 1957. The first American satellite, Explorer 1, followed on January 31, 1958. The first human to orbit Earth was Yuri Gagarin of the Soviet Union on April 12, 1961. John Glenn became the first American to orbit Earth on February 20, on February 20th, 1962. And on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first human to set foot on the moon. In the years since, thousands more satellites representing over 80 countries and citizens of 37 countries have been launched into space. Africa's first spaceport, the San Marco Equatorial Range, opened in 1964 near Malindi, Kenya as a partnership between NASA and the University of Rome. In 1970, the first satellite specifically for X-ray astronomy, Uhuru, was launched from Kenya. The site no longer launches satellites but still tracks them. The African countries from Morocco and Algeria to Ghana, Kenya and Mauritius now use satellites for scientific research, environmental and land use monitoring, radio and television broadcasts, and the internet. <clears throat> Today, we live in a world where space technology is used in our day-to-day -day lives and almost taken for granted. Our aircrafts, ships, cars, and even smartphones know where they are at all times. We have constant views of Earth's weather and storms, and live television or radio broadcasts from anywhere in the world can be received worldwide, even by people who live off the grid. At the international level, the United Nations has an office for outer space affairs which implements the decisions of the United Nations General Assembly and of the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and maintains a database of satellites registered by the nations which launched them. In observance of International Women's Day, my guest via Skype is Professor Maslin Offman, former director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. And prior to taking that office, she was the founding director general of Malaysia's National Space Agency, ANCASA. She is currently the director of the regional office of the International Science Council for Asia and the Pacific. Professor Othman was the first woman to earn a physics PhD from the University of Otago in New Zealand and the first physics PhD in Malaysia. Working in a field that pr was previously dominated by men, she led the way for more women to follow. Professor Maslin, welcome to Africa to you. <laughs> so you have worked in the space field for 29 years now. What has been your experience working in the space industry as a woman over the years? You know, I, I, when I'm working in the space field, I don't really see myself as a woman or see other people as a man or a woman. That's, a, that's the first thing. But in any case, what I've noticed is that in the 29 years, I can see an increasing number of women in the field. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, for instance, take um, the United Nations. Um, when I first uh, sat on the podium of the United Nations in 1999, um, to look at the member states, there were mainly men. But by the time I left in 2013, end of 2013, there was a huge increase in the number of women in that group. So, um, 
So I think the good news is that more and more women are becoming involved in space. And of course, I, I, want, I have to point out that you were appointed by two secretary generals, which is yes. amazing. Yeah. That was Ban Ki-moon and um, First, the late Firstly Kofi by Annan. Kofi Annan. Yeah. And then I left, I went home to set up the Malaysian National Space Agency. And then I was reappointed by Ban Ki-moon. Wow, you must be amazing. <laughs> and then uh -huh. people have a misconception. Sorry? <laughs> it was just unusual circumstances. <laughs> Nothing unusual about me. It's the circumstances well, they were unusual. <laughs> they would pick the best. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so people have a misconception that space is secretive and elitist. Why is that so? And is it still true today? Yes. Okay, I'll answer the, the, the question on why it, why do people feel it's secretive? Mm -hmm. uh, mainly because it's uh, whatever you do in space is uh, there's a duality between what is commercial or civilian and military. Right. That's a big thing. You 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 um, launch one satellite and it could be used both for the military to spy and also to use it for precision agriculture, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there's always that element of secrecy because of the military use. Right. And the other thing is, we're talking about uh, uh, rocket launches, which could also be ballistic missiles. You can't tell the difference between a, ballistic, a launch of a rocket to launch uh, satellites and a ballistic missile. And because of this, um, Everybody fears rockets, just in general, uh, because of the duality of use, of uh, utility of those two things, both satellites and rockets. But would that apply to only the developed countries? Since I think uh, when I look at the, the current launches of not just rockets, but satellites, some are, are just um, suborbital satellites, so they don't, they, they are not long, they don't go far. That's fine. Yes. And uh, but, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So if it's the difference, I mean, uh, does that apply only to developed countries? No. Yeah. I mean, developing countries too can launch their own spy satellites. Oh. <laughs> and they spy on, right. on others. And and the the good thing about space is once you are in space, um, the satellite will go around the Earth, and it does not matter. Um. What, which country is launching the satellite, it will cover the whole Earth. Right. So space is, of course, a uh, broad subject area. And there are various issues, such as the increasing number of satellites in orbit that we're talking about. And uh, yeah. what, do, what do you see as the positives and negatives for society from the use of space? The positives are all there. I mean, uh, you and I are able to do this Skype because somewhere along the line, there was that connection made through a satellite somewhere. Right. You go to the ATM, you withdraw your money, it knows it is you, most probably because that ATM machine connected with a, a headquarters or somewhere through a satellite connection. Right. And like me, I cannot go anywhere without ways. Uh, without GPS, the Global Positioning System. And that's all about satellites. So, you know, there is, um, um, today, almost everything that you do on a daily basis has to do with satellites. Right. But the, but the other thing that most people don't sometimes realize is every time you look at your watch, you look at the uh, huge contributions of the astronomers going back a thousand years. How's that? You, you, you take it for granted. How do you think time is measured? Time is measured um, according to the motion or the, uh, um, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So oh. this orbiting of the Earth around the Sun was first discovered by astronomers. And it was astronomers who plotted um, the movements of the Sun in the sky and movements of the moon in the sky to come up with a calendar and eventually a timekeeping system. You owe all of this to people who have been working in the space field. And of course, from there, it went on to the global positioning system. I mean, the first people who 
who had to use um, navigation mm -hmm. were the astronomers. They had to look at the stars, they had to know where they were, and from the stars, you know where you are. So would so, that qualify... We forget all of that. We would, forget all of that. Would that qualify the, the very old, the ancient ways of navigation as astronomy, in a way? <laughs> of course. Navigation was all about astronomy in the past. It's only when we discovered the clock that we could then uh, use the clock uh, to navigate. Uh, but until then, um, it was all about astronomy. And actually, pilots and people like that, they still learn a little bit of astronomy because just in case their uh, systems break down, at least they'll know how to navigate oh using the stars or the sun or something. I hate to think of a, of a navigation system failing out in space. <laughs> sure. Sure. All right. So um, from your experience, what are the most significant global issues directly linked with outer space? Today, um, the, the thing that worries uh, the um, space community is the fact that there's too much junk uh -huh. out there. You know, you talk about doing something and... Uh, what you need to do is also to ensure that future generations are able to do exactly what you're doing and benefit from that particular activity. Right. And we think that if we continue to generate that kind of debris or junk, soon the future generations will not be able to use uh, space because the space environment is so, uh, so congested. Right. That is a big problem. And what we need to do now is uh, to ensure that uh, going to the future, no more debris is being um, generated. But the bad news is some of the theorists say that we are, we are already at the point, what we call a tipping point, where even if we don't generate any more debris because of constant collision between the bits of debris, that debris population is going to increase anyway. So that's that's the worst case scenario. But the best case scenario is where we come up with schemes to get rid of this debris. Right. There, and there are several interesting um, technologies that want to do this. You might have read about it, but there are still some legal issues. Like if I collect your debris, uh, do I have the right to do that? Do I have the legal right to do that? Maybe not. And then if I collect that debris, does it belong to me or does it belong to you? So there are still those uh, legal issues that have to be sorted out. But the, uh, it remains the fact that the biggest problem we have today is there's too much junk in space. Isn't that where a body like the UN Office for Outer Space would come in to you know, implement or put in place legislation or uh, uh, treaties and uh, uh, that are binding. That's the key word. Binding treaties that people will yeah, right. adhere to. So, so right now, the uh, member states have no appetite for uh, something legally binding. Because, uh -huh. you know, it, it's better that it is uh, not quite free for all, but there's some flexibility in, in how they do the business. Right. And in terms of space debris, the United Nations came up with guidelines but that was all they were and you know guidelines are not legally binding right but the good news is there are some countries that uh, have uh, regulations that are legally binding on their commercial sector for instance uh, the u.s they have particular uh, requirements on space debris which is imposed on uh, whoever's going to be building satellites of course but at the international level they're not um, they're not legally bound to the guidelines. But within their own country, they, they can make their, their um, private sector or whoever that's building satellites to be legally bound to their own regulations. Well, and many countries are quite responsible in that sense. Yeah, you mentioned that the US, for example, it might have a body that ha regulates the amount of uh, satellites you launch. Yes. So does that apply to uh, schools? Uh, we know that U.S. might have sco high schools that um, launch their own satellites because this is a yes. developed country. So there is yes. the, we have the capability to do that. Are they guided under that? 
it's not only U.S. schools that have this ability, schools in Brazil also have this ability. But that is, uh, then that's the issue of small satellites. And we have a problem with that because small satellites become uh, what we call space debris. Mm. Because they have a very short lifetime. Uh, the, the, the only silver lining to that is uh, they're normally not launched high enough to stay in space for a long time. Right. Normally, they're given suborbital. Suborbital means they come down immediately, or if they launch to a lower uh, altitude, where uh, it, within a matter of months, they have they be um, the satellite or the remnants of the satellite will come back to Earth. But you're right. Uh, with all these capabilities, which are now in the hands of school children, uh, <laughs> this issue of space debris is going to escalate. And what would you advise, the, um, you know, your the UN office to do? You know, I know they have guidelines, but those are not binding. And then I know. <laughs> yes, and I shouldn't be advising them what to do. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, we'll no, change that. <laughs> But. It's, it's not. It's not about the office. It's about, as I said before, the appetite of the member states. Right. What is it that they are prepared to do? You know, in the UN, they debate for days whether it should be a full stop or a comma. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, given <laughs> that sort of environment we are operating in, I think it's quite... Um, up, overly optimistic to think that we can come up with new treaties. Yeah, uh, I know some people are trying, but hmm, uh, not many people are optimistic that today we'll get those treaties and conventions the way we did with the five treaties and conventions of the United Nations. Right. Speaking. Uh, of today. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're talking about people are just not going to. They're now exploring other planets, Mars, and so there's going to be explorations uh, to, to the different planets, which increases potential junk. So <laughs> it's not just... Not really. Sir? If they're going to Mars and they're not going to be orbiting the Earth, then it's okay. They'll just go out there. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the rockets that have launched them might still generate some debris, right. but the spacecrafts themselves, when they go to Mars, they're gone from our atmosphere. They're gone from our near near space. So they won't. Those won't add that much to our debris problem. What adds the debris problem is when you have a company say we want to have one thousand small satellites uh, blanketing the Earth so that we have. 24-7, uh, uh, you know, everywhere service uh, for, say, the internet or uh, some kind of communications. Right. Those are the ones that create the problems. And in terms and of... Schools. Yeah. Yes. And then in terms Sorry? of uh, them being out there, what emissions do they give off? In the atmosphere, and okay, is it so we're not talking about emissions here. <laughs> we're talking about when a satellite is in space. Right. Let's, see. Uh, let's say this satellite is in space. Now some of them are this big. They start the paint starts to peel off. So uh, you know you think paints peel off. So what? But in space, uh, a speck of paint will have the momentum of a bullet being fired on Earth. Oh wow! Because the speeds at which they are orbiting the Earth, mm -hmm. and some so it's not only the the paint might peel off, little bits of pieces might fall off, and generate more debris. So that's the kind of uh, problems uh, we have. And then I've been itching to ask before I even ask anything else. With the incre uh, the United States government recently announced the establishment of a space uh force. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Okay, now when we talk, when the Americans talk about Space Force, everybody thinks, oh no, it's like the um, uh, Star Trek. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you call those? Uh, uh, Cylons, you know, the, that kind of warfare. Right. 
but actually, it, it, right now, the Space Force is about uh, being on Earth and controlling what's in, in space. Uh, because I do think we, we, we can all, uh, you know, fly rockets up there and then deploy uh, soldiers up there, which is what people think is the Space Force. Are we, you sure we can't I do that? <laughs> Of course, when you say uh, the U.S. is probably looking at uh, controlling s what is in space but on Earth, uh, we already know that it's hard to control because every country is, um, is doing what they want because there's no really legal uh, binding agreements. Or, um, and uh, I, I know that there are a few that uh, some countries, uh, treaties that some countries have signed and probably a few that have been ratified. Could you uh, briefly talk about those ones? Uh, you mean the treaties themselves? Yes, yes. Yeah, you know that there are five treaties altogether. Yes. The first is the Outer Space Treaty, which is like the Magna Carta of space. Then there, uh, I, I'm not really, I'm not uh, saying them out in, in terms of the chronology, but there's the registration convention, right. there's the rescue agreement, there's the liability convention, and of course there's the moon treaty. Some of those words I'm using are self-explanatory, yeah. but uh, let's say the, the rescue agreement, what are we talking about? We're talking about the rescue of astronauts, and uh, in that agreement we recognize astronauts as emissaries of humankind. Mm. And therefore, if we have a Ugandan um, astronaut land in Namibia, for instance, for, <laughs> for whatever reason, this person cannot be, um, you cannot charge him in court, you know, you, you, he has to be treated like an emissary of humankind and returned to Uganda. <laughs> that is part of the, 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 the philosophy or the principle of the rescue agreement, for instance. And then there's, as I said, there's the registration convention where it obligates member uh, parties, uh, countries that are party to this uh, convention to register whatever object they launch into outer space. Right. Um, the Moon Treaty is uh, uh, the most controversial of all and has the least number of signatories or accessions because Notably, all almost all the spacefaring nations have not signed the, the <laughs> Moon Treaty because the Moon Treaty prevents them from owning uh, from exploring you know, owning bits of, of the Moon. Oh my goodness! So no one wants yeah. to be bound by that. Uh, the no treaty. one wants to be. No, not no one. Some are, um, but it's like the Antarctic, you know. Uh, it took us a long time, in fact, we have failed uh, to uh, get countries to claim parts of the Antarctic. Uh, it's too late now. Uh, countries do own parts of the Antarctic. Oh, okay. Well, this is a lot, um, a lot to learn about outer space. And, uh, of course, uh, being Africa to you, I'll just ask uh, briefly, what do you think is the path for uh, African countries? Yeah, to really be a part of this outer space. I know that there are programs in a few countries, Angola, and, yeah. uh, uh, but what do you project as uh, the future for outer space in Africa? Of course, uh, Africa has a lot to gain and is already gaining and has gained a lot from space applications. Uh, Africa is such a huge continent 
and the only way for you to um, quickly um, assess what's happening in the continent is of course using satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, I only say that uh, when you have a problem, you have to look at all the different options that you have, especially today. You don't really have to go for satellites. You've got high altitude platforms, you've got drones that you can use. But for Africa, uh, with, with the extent, with the expensiveness of Africa and the problems that you have there, um, with the, you know, with desert desertification and things like that, satellites aren't the best uh, assets that you have. Mm. And I know uh, African countries are launching their satellites for those very reasons. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, but you don't have to build your own, say, global positioning system mm. because the Americans have a system, the Chinese are going to be building the system, the Europeans are going to be building that system. So as long as we, put, we are using it for peaceful purposes right. and for commercial purposes, uh, we can be guaranteed of the use of those uh, systems. systems. Yeah. What I'm trying to get at is we don't have to invest and own those satellites all the time for every application. Right. It's good enough that we can use um, the satellites that belong to others. Right. Well, I look forward to, uh, again, um, talking more about Africa's uh, programs, uh, outer space programs at a future date. But for today, thank you so much for being my guest yeah. on Africa thank TV you. for chatting about outer space. And uh, for, to our viewers, for more about Africa to you, visit africatu.org or send me an email at africatu.vivian at gmail.com. And thank you for watching Africa to you. And thank you, Professor Datuk. Muslin Hoffman, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I and, by the full title, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. You don't need to. <laughs> what does Datuk mean? Datuk is a, uh, it's like equivalent to a sir or something like that. It, it's a, it's an honor, on, uh, uh, what is that word? The title? Um, it, it, it's bestowed on people by, by our king. Oh, a okay. Title. Right. A title bestowed by the king. That's all it means. And you, you don't need to know beyond that. <laughs> well, the two Professor Maslin Othman, thank you again yes, for being my guest. Thank and uh, thank you all for watching Africa to you. Till next time.